Mitchell Gaines here with the National Weather Service Office in Binghamton. Going to uh, start here in about another minute or so, and uh, get talk about the talk about you all, the spotters, and how much we appreciate you. Going to give another minute or so for folks to log in and and get settled. Uh, if you're watching this on recording, you may want to fast forward another minute or two through the recording, as there'll be a couple minutes of dead time at the beginning. And sorry about that. All right, looks like we've uh, picked up a couple more people here. We might have another uh, straggler or two coming on in. But uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, a lot of people have been waiting a few minutes here. If you're in the recording, we are getting ready to start now. So you can quit fast forwarding at this time through the first few minutes of dead space. Thank you for bearing, bearing with us here. My name is Mitchell Gaines, a meteorologist at the National Weather Service office in Binghamton, New York. And this is basically a spotter appreciation talk. So today marks December 5th, which is the National Skywarn Spotter Appreciation Day. Usually this day is celebrated by having ham radios uh, come into weather service forecast offices and, and actually ha have radio broadcasts going on uh, all throughout the, the day in a 24 hour period. Uh, unfortunately, this year, uh, with uh, with ongoing concern, ongoing concerns in society, are unable to provide that service. So those folks that are normally come in are uh, called ham radio operate or ham radio operators and amateur radio. But this year we decided to extend it out to all the spotters and do something that's more or less a, a uh, appreciate a appreciation and a, a and a acknowledgement of all that you have contributed to our operations uh, and our forecasting abilities here at the National Weather Service office in Binghamton uh, throughout the past year and even longer. So I'm going to go through several different topics today. And of course, right as soon as I get ready to start the app, there it goes. So today is what's nationally referred to as Skywarn Recognition Day. You can see by the nice logo in front there across the entire country. 
and we're going to be talking about several different things today. This is not a spotter training talk. So if you were looking for a winter or severe or flood spotter training talk, this is not going to be it today. The severe one is already on our website and the winter one will be posted to our website soon. If you missed one of those previous five training sessions earlier in the year, that will be posted to our website. You can view, you can view those online once they're on there and email me at mitchell.gaines, mitchell with two L's, gaines, G-A-I-N-E-S, at noaa.gov, uh, letting me know that you've completed those and I can update your year of uh, that you last took the spotter training. We will look into the history of the National Weather Service and what equipment the National Weather Service has used. We're going to take a look at the overview of the forecast process, going all the way from the start of the forecast process, seven to 10 days out, all the way to how your reports are used here at our office. I'm going to talk about some external NWS activities as well and Weather Ready Nation. And finally, since we cannot do tours during, uh, based on the current societal uh, situation, we, I have included a virtual office tour here on this presentation tonight. So thank you all for joining us on a Saturday evening when there's a plethora of activities, especially with the holidays uh, in in full swing here. Thank you very much for taking time out of your evening to join us and also for being a weather spotter throughout the course of the year. It's a volunteer position, obviously, and every minute of time you have is very valuable and we appreciate that time. So a little bit more of a breakdown on what the National Weather Service is. We start with a little bit of a historical overview. So in 1849, Smithsonian Institute supplies weather instruments to telegraph companies to establish the first observational network. In 1870, the US Weather Bureau was formed to take meteorological weather observations and give notice of storms for maritime interests. 1890, a military agency is established under the Department of Under the Department of War, and hang on, we have going to troubleshoot uh, a, a issue here for someone. Just hold on one second, please. All right, so continuing to move on here. Again, if anybody has any troubleshooting issues or any questions, uh, feel free to, there should be a space you can see here. I'm hovering right over the raised hand feature. I'm trying to, of course, looks like that we are on here. So I saw somebody's hand was raised. Was there a, oh shoot, I'm, apologies for that. It's going through everybody's emails on me. Uh, you saw that there was a question. If you have a question, if you could go right up to the drawing tool menu there and actually, where is that question here? We're, the go-to webinar we're using is always changing. So there should be a questions option. Let's see here, if you go to options, my screen is probably a little bit different than yours, so we will continue to move on. If there are any questions, uh, you should be able to, actually, there's a questions icon here. Uh, it's like, okay, that's the question we already answered. All right. 
Okay, sorry for the delay. Moving on. So 1940, the U.S. Weather Bureau moved to the Department of Commerce. And then in 1970, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, was established. And the U.S. Weather Bureau became part of NOAA and renamed it to the National Weather Service, the NWS, uh, which is where you're sending your weather reports into. Of course, just as I work through this here, my screen freezes up. So uh, in, the, in the ages of the webinar, you always have your technical issues. So we're actually going to keep on going here in hopes that the technical issues will become resolved. There we go. And all it needed was a little boost. And so we move on to sending the reports into the National Weather Service. They are 122 reports, or 122 National Weather Service offices nationwide. And see, we are the office in Binghamton, New York, covering most of South Central New York and into Northeastern Pennsylvania as well. So there are 122 offices across the entire country. You see, going all the way from New York, all the way down to California, to Florida, to Alaska, to Hawaii, and beyond. So there are a lot of National Weather Service offices out there. So to break down things here in the National Weather Service Binghamton, what our core functions are. So we issue for weather forecasts and warnings, build and maintain relationships with local and state governments, provide expert advice to the public and key partners, conduct awareness and education, train volunteer observers and storm spotters. In terms of the technology of, how, of what we use today in the weather service, we started off with the first weather balloon, which had a actual radio sonde attached to it back in 1937. 1959, the first Doppler radar came along with WSR-57, weather surveillance radar. First weather satellite, the Kiros-1 in 1960. 1973, we move up to the WSR-74. Radar starts to advance, and then today the advancements continue through modern day. So equipment and observations. So these are a lot of the networks that we have. We currently have the WSR-88D radar. You can see there we have cooperative weather observers. Uh, we have our automated surface observation stations, river gauges from the USGS. We have buoys out on the Great Lakes and oceans. Radio songs as well, which are weather balloons, which collect a lot of weather data for us. And aircraft as well, most notably the hurricane hunters. So we have all this information that comes in and you ask, why do we need weather spotters? How do weather spotters factor into how the National Weather Service uh, conducts its forecasts? We start out with the big trends, big picture and trends. Move on to some experience and expertise. We'll take a look at model guidance, form our forecast, take recent history and observations into account. And as that forecast is playing out, we rely on the spotter for that ground truth weather information in order to see how the forecast is playing out. In addition, we use spotter in, your spotter information in context of being able to use your information and in sort of a database sort of fashion for past events as well to see how the forecast did in terms of accuracy. So we start out with the longer term view here and the forecast process. So we basically start with a fairly wide hemispheric view in the forecast process. So when you look out seven to 10 days, in fact, this example here is from hour 240, 
courtesy of Tropical Tidbits, you can see that we're looking at a very large area and very little detail. What this is, is this is looking way up in the atmosphere. So you're looking up several thousand feet, even higher than that, in this case of around the 500 millibar pressure level. Of course, the pressure falls off from what it is at the surface as you go up way up in the atmosphere. So we're looking way up in the atmosphere, what we call roughly the mid-levels. We can see here that the blue is represented by low pressure in the mid-levels, and the red is represented by high pressure in the mid-levels. So it's very similar to what you see on your weather map every night on the news of your high and low pressure system. What you can see here is a general pattern that shows if this is right, this information seven to 10 days out, there's going to be a ridge of high pressure over the West Coast and a trough of low pressure through the Ohio Valley. And that blue blob, got a question in here. Okay, we've got a little technical difficulties. I guess I see one report that uh, uh, somebody's just seeing a blank screen. Let's see here. Should be able to see the webinar fully here. It says, so showing up that pretty much the whole audience is seeing it. So let's see here. Looks good on this end. Okay, so Jeff, uh, one thing you can try, Jeff, if you're hearing this, is to go out of the webinar and then come back in again. You don't need a webcam or anything, but uh, but if you can just try that and try getting out and then coming back in again, that might be the trick here in terms of trying to load this presentation up along with making sure you have a solid internet connection on your end. Okay, it looks like a few people, thank you for chiming in, that we are fine. Give Jeff another second or so here. We'll stay on this slide for him to get caught up with us. Uh, again, technical difficulties are part of the process, so thank you for bearing with us uh, as we do these uh, presentations in a virtual format. So taking a look at that big blue blob across northern Canada, I guess if anyone wants to comment and guess on what that is, I guess I'll put a question out, a poll here out. So use the button below to create a poll. Let's see here. I don't want to drag this on too long, so. All right, so if you're at home, if you think that that blue blob is a is the polar vortex, polar vortex is option A. Option B will be a just a strong area of low pressure, or option C will be a a dose of spring time. So A, B, or C, if you want to comment below on what that is. Again, C is the springtime, B is just a strong low pressure system, and A is the polar vortex. Looks like we got B, got C. One person says A. So, so far we're kind of mixed on this, on what we believe it is. So there I am right there. Wave high right there. And see, I have in the background, I should have started with that, obviously, uh, my name being Mitchell Gaines. I have been here now close to three years as a uh, meteorologist, got my undergraduate degree at the University of Kentucky and my graduate degree at Western Kentucky University. See, in the background, we put some of our most noteworthy achievements and also a little bit of background about our office as a whole and some of the services we're providing, which we're going to touch on throughout this presentation today.
Well, we got A, some C's and B's. And so we're kind of all over the place on what this could be. So the correct option is A. A is the correct choice here. That is actually the polar vortex you've heard so much about on the news uh, from time to time every winter. So whoever guessed A or thought A in your head and didn't have an opportunity to put it in, you are correct. That is the polar vortex up there in the Arctic Circle. And you can see based on this pattern overall that the can follow the basically these lines, the black lines that I have on my screen on your screen to show the general overall motion of the jet stream or the air at that level. You can see here all that cold air is bogged up across Canada. You can see as we head toward the middle of the month, it looks like we'll just have a fairly seasonable pattern. Not a whole lot of cold air around, and of course, probably the warmest air compared to normal in California along the West Coast still. So the forecast process continues through the training process. So you can see here my training curriculum that's due here in a few days. So our forecasters have to undergo an extensive amount of schoolwork, preparatory work, training on, an, on a day in day out basis to be the best that we can possibly be at forecasting the weather because there's a whole lot that goes on with weather forecasting. So the training, this is my uh, seasonal readiness training uh, for FY21. You can see here that a lot of the meteorologists uh, here at the office have similar training plans to what I have. So this is talking about we have a winter weather drill, forecasting ice storms, and just one example of a considerable list of training modules on there, utilizing anomalies to it, uh, which is basically uh, forecasting high impact winter storms is a fancy, is a simple way to put that. So that training and development also extends to also extends to student volunteers and mentoring of new employees and continued mentorships even among all employees in the office. So what you're seeing on the left, if you know of anybody that is a college student, again, that'll be highly dependent on how the situation is evolving with the COVID-19 COVID virus. We do have a volunteer program for college students. One example there on the uh, center of the screen uh, Carter Humphreys, one of our former student volunteers, currently looking to get a full-time position within the Weather Service. You can see here, the next picture over is a training situation between two meteorologists there uh, doing training of a past weather event uh, in order to be able to enhance their radar skills in that case. And then below, you see a lot of people in a large uh, a classroom there with a lot of our weather service workstations. That's basically radar training boot camp 101 out in Norman, Oklahoma. So you go out, so a lot of our meteorologists go out there for a week at a time, learn about the forecast process with regards to severe storms and take a week long course in order to be uh, on being able to analyze and interpret Doppler radar. Moving on to the next slide. So we mentioned we interpret a lot of that data, a lot of training development going on through both through the computer, through classroom environment. Again, my schooling, for example, you gotta get a fairly healthy math and physics background at a minimum as part of the major. There's a lot of coursework that builds up to become a meteorologist to use all the information that we get. So we move from training and development and looking at our bigger picture to more of the nuts and bolts of, the, of making a forecast in that model data. So you can see here there's model data. Looks like we have a couple of questions here. So our, it looks like uh, 
looks like it should be if it hasn't moved on now here in the past minute but it should be there now i had to exit the slideshow temporarily so we had a little bit of juggling there So we'll keep on going here. So this is the model data. So what this is showing is actually of tomorrow morning of what one of our weather models, the global forecast systems model uh, has in, ter in terms of what's going on in our weather. So best way to explain these models is they take a lot of the math and physics of the of basically trying to attempt to picture out atmospheric behavior. So physics, a lot of these complicated mathematical equations go into actually determining how the atmosphere could potentially behave. These weather models uh, have their own sets of, of physical equations and derive or basically project out what the weather is going to be over a course of several hours, several in several days. Of course, as you go further and further out, the more uncertainty that's present. One of those models is the global forecast systems model. And you can see here tomorrow morning, it thinks there's going to be a strong low pressure across eastern Maine. There's going to be precipitation uh, heading into Maine there uh, as that low pressure continues to move up the coast. And over us, it has a little bit of precipitation as well but it's a lot of the lighter color variety, which is fairly weak, more indicative of some flurries and light snow showers around. Several other images, we can look at several different things at a time on one of these displays. That includes a satellite imagery as well of all the clouds, the mild data, and also the current observations highlighted in green there and our radar data too. So we look at a lot of different things at once Although we have these green observations for, for actual uh, sensors, particularly out at airports, there's a lot of area in between that we're not getting a lot of information for. So we continue the process here of where we put our forecast information into. So you all being the spotters come in with reports during real time events, which our forecasters factor in that with their experience and intuition and actually begin to make changes to the overall forecast using a program called the graphical forecast editor. So the forecasters develop basically, you can think of these as art drawings in a way so they can upload all the computer model data they want which computer model they think is right in a certain situation and they pull all that information into this graphical forecast editor uh, through the computer process through the uh, through the AWIPS program let's see here I think we have should be on here advanced weather information processing system for AWIPS so then we continue to move on. Forecasters use that to generate all sorts of products. So what products in particular? So we start out several days in advance with an outlook and then move on to the watch warning and advisory phase and advisory phases depending on how hazardous the weather is. And it looks at a few days out, there's still some uncertainty. Excuse me here for a sec. Uh, we will issue what is called a watch product. In the case of severe weather, that's issued about six hours or so in advance by the Storm Prediction Center. If we go up to a warning or an advisory, that means that something is imminent or already occurring, and that it will have an impact. The weather will have an impact on day-to-day -day life. So advisory is more of that nuisance type of event, while a warning is event-driven in that hazardous weather is basically occurring it's going to be high impact and to take action to avoid injury and protect property 
Non-routine products include severe thunderstorm warnings, winter storms, floods, hurricanes, stuff like heat, heat advisories, wind chill, frost and freeze. And then these continue on with our routine forecast too. We'll issue aviation forecasts, which go out 24 hours for a lot of the regional airports in the area too. So your reports are also very helpful with those aviation forecasts as well. Okay, so now we're in, in the battle here. So the forecaster has looked through all, all that information, all that fancy information the computer gives them, and it comes down to their strong and severe storms in the area. And you can see here there's several moving across central Pennsylvania heading toward our area. So let's see the thunderstorm out toward Tioga County, Pennsylvania, and north central PA continues advancing east, gets ready to move into the area. Well, through that hazardous weather outlook, the uh, forecasters have hopefully conveyed that the spotter activation will be needed. So those spotters in Bradford County, Pennsylvania will be ready to go. And uh, that information will come in. You can see that the forecasters to our west out in State College are using that, not only what they're getting in from the observations, and the forecast, all that fancy, all that information through the uh, AWIPS computer system, but then they're also getting calls on the phone. This is where you all come in as a spotter and you're so much help to us. All this information comes in on the phone, through our social media platform, so on and so forth. So they're using that information you can see to actually we can see that yellow button at the top called Warn Gen there. They're actually using your reports to decide whether or not to push that button and issue what you can see that brown uh, polygon there referred to as an SPS or the yellow polygon what's referred to as a severe thunderstorm warning for that even stronger storm uh, around the state college area. And then, of course, as more and more information comes in, forecasters are able to make the make a uh, more and more informed decision. And let's say that the storm is getting close to that Syracuse International Horse Show. Oh, we got a spotter report in for Cayuga County saying, "Look, there's this storm. It doesn't look much on look much on radar, but we just got hit with some large hail, damaging winds that knocked down trees." Well. <clears throat> We actually can call the first responders, police, fire department, et cetera, that, that uh, need weather information at the International Horse Show. We can tell them, hey, uh, we, you've got a big thunderstorm coming in. We've got a report of such and such hail, damaging winds. It's knocked over a lot of trees. They go ahead and they can say, okay, we got weather information coming in. They relay it to all the police, EMS fire that are on site and they begin to in in most cases if they get information like that they'll begin to evacuate people that are outside to a place that's safe uh, on the grounds of where that horse show is taking place so your information is most vital and that's why we wanted to have a little uh, short presentation this evening on what is our national spotter appreciation day to make sure to extend that appreciation out to everyone and so you've been asked to give your information for our database wondering what is that information used for again it's a request it's not obviously not a requirement if you don't want to give us your personal contact information but you are more than welcome to you can see here this is a radar overlay over a lot of black dots the purple dot is actually my house, uh, which is just a little bit southwest of our office. Excuse me again. You can see all the black dots are that of locations of weather spotters that we have. Again, uh, particularly I'm leading the effort here to get all of your information into this database, which we call IRIS. And so this is a database that we have to enter in reports of and also keep contact lists of spotters. So if there's a storm coming toward Elmira, I can click on the black dot there that pulls up your information. 
can say, shoot you a quick message. Hey, what have you seen? Uh, and that, that allows the communication to be two-way, both between you calling in something and we can contact you as well on your schedule. That's important. We can contact you on your schedule. You are not obligated in any way uh, to communicate with us, especially we know you have jobs and other hobbies, interests going on in life, other commitments as well. We don't expect you to be 24 seven on this, just whenever you have extra time. We may take a shot and say, hey, we're really looking for information in Elmira. Uh, pull up the spires, maybe send out an email or, or a quick telephone call, only last a minute or two. Have your information, let us know what's going on. And as well, you can see right now, this is a work in progress because I've entered in a lot of data in the Binghamton area, Elmira area, Scranton area, but there's a lot of information that still needs to be filled in, which I've got a few more hundred of uh, information for a few more hundred folks to put in as well in addition to this to help really fulfill this map and make it all filled with black dots. Then you can see here we pull in a lot of reports into our iris as well and we can enter report. Use your contact information you're calling in. Excuse me again. Of course, I get a little of uh, allergy nose irritation the day I forget to take allergy medicine. So we can blame my uh, forgetting to take allergy medicine on a couple of these short breaks here. But you can look here at our iris. We pull in information from wherever. We can enter it in here. You can pull up your contact information. This is basically our one-all database to create two products in which your reports are used in on a regular basis. So I'm going to skip ahead to those here. The example on the left is the public information statement. You can see here, you can go down to our Madison County there. You can see one of our reports labeled as train spotter. That is somebody who has called in that report in, in Chittenango. Also, if we go toward the LSR example here, difference between the LSR and the what's called the public information statement, PNS, is that the LSR is more to noteworthy something significant happening. Uh, example, snowfall rate, measurement of snow when the reports are starting to first come in. We'll send out these LSRs, you can see here. And if you're on the call, congratulations, by the way, you're featured in this uh, slide here. Example on the left is in Oneida County, a half an inch. Only a few locations got snow, so typically you're way up there in Oneida County, half an inch isn't too noteworthy. And then you go out for the same event in Lansing in Tompkins County of 1.8 inches of snowfall. That was that event, if I remember correctly, was a little bit more localized off the Finger Lake. So that's where particularly that comes into play. And we're going to go back here for ways to get involved as well. Of course, you have your Skywarn spotters, you've taken the training, BGM forward slash BGM Skywarn storm report, and go online again, weather.gov forward slash BGM. A couple other ways to get involved too, if you're looking to dig deeper into the weather field, uh, cocoras.org, C O C O R A H S, and MPing too. So you could, those are two other methods uh, to send in your reports to us as well. So let's see. So we've sent in your information here, your spotter reports for the PNS, LSR. These go out to a lot of our media and partner groups, the general public, folks wanting to know how much snow's falling in their community, local law enforcement uh, making contingency plans for their next shift on what's going on with the what's going on with the storm in their area. Snow plow drivers need this information in order to make their living in terms of how much snow has fallen. So these reports are a considerable public service. Same goes with the severe and the flood reports in the spring and summer seasons, respectively. 
So we're getting these reports in, mainly focusing on winter here because we're getting ready to head into winter. But this is basically you put all those reports in here to a mapping system using something called Geographic Information Science or GIS. So all your reports go into this mapping system and we can pull it up. This is an example from way back in November of 2016. See here, all these reports are showing up and you can see, look across Broome County. You can see that in Appalachian on the other side of the Broome County border in Tioga County, 10.1 inches of snow fell, while only 15 miles away at our, the, the Binghamton Airport here, we got 27.7 inches through this event. Same goes just south of Ithaca as well, where mounts were over two feet. Go to the southern part of the county, only a few inches of snow fell there in, in Tioga County. So quite the wide range of snowfall totals with this event. Same goes around Utica as well. You can look at anything from close to three feet out by Syracuse, to less than 10 inches as you get toward Roman Utica in Oneida County. So quite the, particularly dealing with the Great Lakes and the Finger Lakes is you can have a very short distance between snowfall amounts that vary quite a bit. Same goes with wind damage and tor even tornadoes or even on a more localized scale. So that's why you, we use your reports day in and day out, and they're vital to us. We want to pass along that thanks again for your reports. And this is one example of your labor of going out there and taking observations. Unfortunately, we see me again on the bottom left-hand corner dealing with flood safety awareness. Also have service awards as well for those folks who've been taking weather observations uh, for us for many, many years. We like to extend uh, more of our permanent weather observers uh, some appreciation. Media interviews, we get a lot of requests for information from media. So that's where some of your reports, we can provide those to our uh, partners in the media as well. Of course, taking Skywarn classes. Some of you may know that's our uh, warning coordination meteorologist, Dave Nicosia in the bottom right. I'm on the bottom left doing a media interview and uh, working on the station next to me is uh, Mark Pellerino, one of our uh, lead meteorologists. Basically, between the meteorologist as a forecaster, the lead meteorologist is a uh, lead forecaster on shift, is, is the lead forecaster position. And of course, there's uh, former Sue, uh, Mike Evans here at, the, at, at our office handing out a service award, and our hydrologist in the upper right-hand corner of the screen Jim Brewster as well, uh, participating in a media interview. Hopefully by seeing some of our faces as well, you get to know us a little bit better. It's another part of the talk today. Hopefully you're being able to see me a little bit, talk into the camera throughout the presentation. And you're gonna be talking with uh, some new individuals as well. We've gotten several new meteorologists on board in the past year that are going through the training process that I laid out in terms of developing their skills, meteoro uh, meteorology skills within the weather service to become the best meteorologists that they become. So you may hear a few new, new voices this winter when you're calling in your spotter reports. Uh, these folks are, have been trained or in the process of being, tra of being uh, trained up fully on all of our operations and they're gonna be critical parts uh, to our team moving forward. So we mentioned that horse show up in Syracuse. So we got a report here at the uh, example. The example here in this slide is Super Bowl, but actually going more one to local example, the New York State Fair is one in which uh, during normal societal circumstances, we would be sending someone out uh, most days of the New York State Fair up in Syracuse on a regular basis uh, to provide on-site on weather support. So if we get a re that report out of Cayuga County that says, uh-oh, there's a lot of wind coming in, we can let the folks, the police and other responders, emergency support personnel on-site know that the weather's gonna be rapidly changing and they can begin to make sure that safety is taken into 
is taken into account for the approaching weather. So we brief local, state, federal officials, daily briefings, conference calls, particularly during significant weather events. We put what's called a weather story up on our webpage. It basically summarizes what's going on for the day-to-day -day weather, in addition to the point-and-click forecast. See here, these are some of the examples of impact-based decision support services. It's not always an event such as the state fair. It can be sometimes an explosion, uh, particularly in the example on the left that releases a lot of chemicals into the air need to know wind direction and speed fairly quickly and over a fairly extended time frame. So here the next picture to the right is someone actually working in an emergency operations center with several different police officers and other agencies providing that weather briefing. And you can even have uh, emergency managers from various counties calling into our office from time to time as well, looking for that weather information. So particularly during the high impact weather situations, we definitely appreciate hearing from you as spotters on what's going on with the weather, because not only is it you, what you're seeing on the surface reports uh, going out for public knowledge for climate records, but they're also being used in some critical weather, uh, critical decisions made for weather safety within your community as well. So if you, you're part of a business and you're interested in learning more about the weather or becoming weather, becoming more weather ready at your place of employment, there's Weather Ready Nation, weather.gov forward slash ready, about building community resi resilience in the face of increasing vulnerability to extreme weather and water events. Be informed and prepared is the bottom line here. So with that Weather Ready Nation, you can be what's called a Weather Ready Nation ambassador and your place of business uh, can, can actually, or your community even, can be part of the Weather Ready Nation Storm Ready program to be prepared for severe weather. So we're going to start on a little virtual tour of our office here, and then I will answer it up for questions that you may have as spotters. Uh, want to pass along anything to us in terms of feedback about how the program's going. We'll take that information as well and be able to make adjustments. Again, current anticipation is that the spring programs, or at least the current guess, I will say that's my personal current guess, this isn't official or anything, is that a lot of the spotter programs we provide will be of a virtual format again. Nothing set in stone, nothing official, but just a heads up on that. Still probably going to have to keep things virtual uh, given what's going on in society right now. So we're going to start off our virtual tour. Again, this has to replace a potential actual tour. If you were a ham radio operator, normally come into our office on this day every year. Unfortunately, this is kind of the uh, substitution that we're making here. So you basically come in the front door, look off to your right. You're looking at a lot of observational equipment, a couple of decorative plants around, a couple of photos to a nice lounge area out in front. Then you move on to looking down the hallway. You can see this basically goes outside as well as coming uh, inside. You'll normally, normal circumstances, there would be an administrative support assistant there to greet you. Next slide, you can see that close up of the side there is our Weather Ready Nation ambassadors. You can see several businesses, media stations, emergency management offices have all become Weather Ready Nation ambassadors working with us. And of course, we have uh, several different managers' offices as well, including our meteorologist in charge. And yes, I did put that graphic on there for a little bit of humor that has been. Uh, uh, by his front door for quite a while now. His name is Doug. So if you ever seen that commercial, I'm not endorsing Liberty Mutual Insurance in any way, but there he is with the EMU. And then we have several electronics and informational technology folks and equipment maintained out in the field by our observing program leader too. So all have offices uh, within our building as well. Of course, we have an office space 
And this looking, you can look into the mail copier room. And now we finally come out to the good stuff on our operations floor. You can see we have several uh, situational awareness displays. I did not get a picture of all of them, but there's a couple of them in case of severe weather. We will have those on to see what's going on. You can see my workstation is actually open there to the right that has this presentation that I was working on at the same time as taking some of these photographs. And you can see limited staffing as well uh, throughout these photos of the ops floor. We generally only have two to three people on at a time, so everyone can keep a safe distance from each other. So that's a quick look at our operations floor. And you can see one of those uh, uh, AWIPS workstations. Every one of these kiosks of several monitors is an AWIPS workstation, those automated weather information processing systems that we use on a day in day out basis. We also have PCs as well. And this is gonna wrap up our present, our questions, but I left on quite a bit of time at the end for, for uh, any comments. And let's see if I can pull that back up here. So I'm gonna pull out myself. It looks like we have several questions. Oh, it looks like at, uh, oh geez. Looks like that we have, uh, okay, nobody saw the tour, it looks like. The screen froze, oh no, okay. So I see that, uh, unfortunately, we had a couple people leave us here. So I'm gonna go back to the tour. So I'm gonna minimize that and I'm gonna advance the slides through this screen. So can anyone see the tour slides now? Had a little bit of a glitch here. Can we see the tour slides now? Okay, everyone's saying that they cannot. Okay, let's see what's going on here. Oh boy, having the technical difficulties. Apologies from that. Let's see, cannot see what's going on. There we go, I think I see what happened. Now can we see what's going on? There we go, all right, 7.52. Again, I wasted 10 minutes of everybody's time. My apologies. Must have been something that had clicked on or had reset or something, so now everyone can see the tour slide. It's a nice one, the fix is easy. See, there is our lobby area as you're coming in. Hopefully that the photos will make more sense now with what uh, gibberish I'm talking about. So there's the lobby coming in. There you look down the hall at, at our office as a whole. When you enter, we go from the lobby to where you enter there. And then a little close up here on our Weather Ready Nation Ambassador uh, focus. You can see these are a lot of uh, groups that we partner with in order to increase weather, weather weather awareness to the maximum extent possible. And you can see here is the picture of our meteorologist in charge's office and the little icon that's viewable of Liberty Mutual, <laughs> given his name is Doug. A little bit of an inside office joke have offices for our electronics technicians and other personnel who day in and day out maintain all of the equipment for us. Our office supply room. Finally, on to the good stuff with our operations floor. Again, limiting staffing uh, given the current situation. See there, actually, you're looking at the back panel of our radar display. In addition to several of those automated weather information processing stations and then you can see the other panel as well that's my workstation you can see some of those displays up you've already seen graphical forecast editor in addition to windows pcs as well see here we have several of those larger computer monitors which are known as situational awareness displays and we'll go ahead and take questions here looks like they are a few questions 
Uh, can you show the spotter map again? Sure thing, John. Let me go back to that slide. Hold on one second. Again, it is a work in progress, so it is only about a fifth of the way done. Well, let's go back to it here. I can show that again. So not all the spotters are in. Only certain counties are on that map at this point. So that is not everyone's information. It's kind of amongst in my regular forecasting duties is to chip away a little bit at this every day. Uh, so that's why you don't see anything around the Ithaca area in particular is that we're, it's a work in progress in terms of getting all this information in. Definitely if you've taken one of our classes too, pretty much everybody's information is in. We have a record of it. And then it will be getting onto this map here over the course of the next several weeks. Uh, so right now you can see that I've basically made it through the L's in terms of the county. So that's why you see a lot of reports around Lackawanna and Luzerne and not, let's say, Oneida or Tompkins per se. So still a little bit of legwork on this overall, but you can see that our spotter network is fairly ex expansive. And thanks to you all again uh, for giving us an opportunity to connect and for you taking time out to provide weather information. And we hope to be able to utilize this, especially by the severe weather season. So let's see here. Uh, we have, let's see if we have any more questions here. Again, thank you everyone for being a weather spotter and uh, taking the time to be with us. Let's see questions here. Okay, a question from Joyce. Best way to communicate with us? Well, that's a multitude of ways. So we're looking at anywhere from our Facebook page to our um, to our Twitter account. You can tweet and Facebook your reports in as well. Make sure to indicate that you are a trained spotter uh, with that information, with those reports. You can also call our office as well. I'll get that phone number here in a minute shortly. I don't think it's on any slide. Uh, that we have in this presentation, but you can go back through uh, some of our past presentations if you need that information again. I'll be happy to send that out. Just send me a quick email on that. Uh, our email as well, bgm.stormreport at noaa.gov. We're monitoring that as well for reports. So we try to have as many different ways as possible for which we obtain weather reports here. Uh, and whatever basically works for you the best. So whether it's through Facebook, whether you're more of a one-on-one -on, -one on the phone, uh, any which way you prefer, we have about five different methodologies for everyone to send in reports. Uh, whatever method works for you, our forecasters are monitoring those, those uh, all these different uh, information feeds 24-7. Again, thanks everybody for being on tonight. Continue to take questions here. I always leave a little extra time on the end. So it did say that the, uh, so the next question here from Thomas is, are we getting data in from the COCORAS website? The answer is yes. Uh, we most certainly are. So if your spotter reports every day are going through COCORAS, we are getting them through that method as well. In fact, let me go back. Let's see here in the PNS slide. I think it was this far back. I must have skipped over it here. We get all get dizzy going through the presentation again. There we are right here. So you can see that, let me clear my screen or move that over to the side. You can see here, there's a lot of Coco Ross reports within this PNS. How we get that information is that it comes into us, the Coco Ross website basically dumps data at about 9.30 in the morning uh, into, uh, into our system. So when we actually pull up that Coco Ross information, it's already ingested in into our systems here to go out in those PNS and LSR reports. 
So yes, we are getting data from the Coco Ross website. We actually have a product as well called the LCO, which is issued about 10 o'clock every morning. All righty here, so I'll continue to take questions again. Thank you all very much for being spotters at our office. We wanted to extend an appreciation as this is the national day within our agency to do so. Taking even five minutes out of your day to provide weather information. Hopefully you've learned a little bit about how your information is used and about the forecast process in general of where the spotter fits in a little bit more in depth perspective than what the traditional spotter training classes um, have to offer. So again, thanks for bearing with the technical difficulties. I'll stay on another five minutes or so for any questions, and then we'll log out and uh, resume the rest of your evening. Hopefully you have fun holiday plans or, or, or other plans that are also very enjoyable for the weekend. We're gonna try to get the sunshine out at some point. I know it's been frustrating lately, but, uh, but we're hoping that it's, some point we're going to do our best to get the sun back out again so stay on here another four minutes or so so a question is about how many on the webinar tonight uh we had about 50 overall that signed up there were 52 signups saw attendance was about 26 folks uh, that's 50 percent which is fairly typical again you no know, kind of looking at a saturday night here a lot of hubbub surrounding the holidays so I appreciate the turnout tonight, even though you might think that in the 20s is a fairly low number. I think that is uh, definitely given all, all the competition we have uh, for what's going on out there in the world. I think that's a fairly solid number. So I appreciate you all joining on this uh, call this evening and being a part of our program. So thank you very much for that question. Uh, thank you very much as well for the feedback. I'm seeing several kind comments on here and I appreciate them. And uh, we'll continue to stay on for another few more minutes here for any final questions. So we can say, uh, email a presentation. Uh, again, apologies, John, for not being able to see it. Uh, we will definitely, I'll definitely go ahead, write down a note on my pad right now to email presentation. Uh, within our webinar program, we can see who is on the presentation and who is not. So that helps filter it out. Uh, but definitely, uh, you can see that uh, all that information. Okay, and the uh, does Dave Morford have any of these Skyworn patches available? Unfortunately, the answer is no. We do not have any Skyworn patches available. Uh, I could go into the nitty and gritty of why we don't. Uh, it's unfortunate that we do not have them available or something more to show our appreciation besides this webinar tonight has, has to do with uh, the in and out politics. Okay, we lost audio temporarily, so I'll start on this question again. So basic, the sky one patches, the answer is no. That's very unfortunate. It's very unfortunate from my perspective as well that we don't have anything more to show appreciation. That's just the climate we're in nowadays. And uh, the process uh, to become a spotter, again, this is not a spotter training session. Uh, we, will, uh, we will provide those again in the spring. So you can go online right now. There are three videos you can take. Send me an email letting, letting me know you did those videos. That will count. Same thing with the winter presentation as well. That should be up, I'm hoping, by Tuesday depending on how everything plays out with weather and other duties this over the next few days. Uh, yeah, the patches are not for sale either. We, we can't obviously sell anything being a government agency. Uh, COVID calming down, opening back up for tours. Yes, that's basically, uh, that's basically what is boils down to on why we're limited in some capacity is that COVID concern. Uh, that's my intention at this point. This leader of the outreach program here at the here at our office is to open things back up for tours, but that's going to be something we have to look at. We have to get through the uh, current societal situation and then be able to evaluate that once things improve. So we are definitely looking forward to things improving 
and hope to be able to provide that service again. Uh, happy holidays to everyone as well. I should have mentioned that. I did mention the holiday hubbub, so definitely want to wish everybody happy holidays on the call, and these slides will be emailed out to everyone. So do we have any more questions here before wrapping it up tonight? So Merry Christmas to you and ha Happy Hanukkah and a happy holiday season overall. Happy Kwanzaa. And uh, thank you all for attending this evening. And we'll begin to wrap it up here. Let you get on with the uh, other arrangements. And Dave Morford, I saw his name pop up in the uh, feed here. He has retired. A couple of months ago, Dave Morford retired uh with us here so that's one of our new meteorologists came from that position and uh dave dave of course we thanked him for his service unfortunately we were unable to have a proper retirement party for him because of what's going on we hope to have that at some point for those of those of you who know him and again if you want to if you have his information want to reach out privately i'm sure he would like to hear from you uh, if you want to pass around, pass along your best wishes to him. If you've worked with Dave, Dave Morford over the years, not Dave, Dave Nicosia is still working in his current role as Warren Coordination Meteorologist. So, are there any final questions here tonight uh, before we wrap up the presentation? All right. With that being said, wish everybody happy holiday season and a great rest of the weekend thank you very much for being spires and joining us this evening hopefully you learned a little bit about more about how your reports are used uh, here at our office and hope you continue being spires going on here in the future look for information about those uh spring spire training sessions as well and our other educational webinars i should have plugged that a little bit earlier too uh, we do have those that are being off and are offered as well, usually once a month on those. So thank everybody for coming out tonight. Hope you have a great rest of the night and I'll be logging this off now.